Hans for allowing me to give a talk, or two talks actually, in the summer school. And I would also like to apologize for dragging everybody down here from the nice comfortable room. Uh, simply because I didn't prepare any slides for the lectures. Well, I, I sincerely apologize for this. I feel like I'm the only one who does that. So, uh, the two lectures that I'm going to give will be about some very basic ideas about state estimation or state model. And these lectures are meant for students who are new to the field and who would like to learn some basic stuff before they start reading papers related to state tomography and just going to talk a little bit about some of these aspects. Um, Mario actually gave a very excellent introduction to quantum states, quantum measurements, and some of the things I'm going to say will overlap the material that he just presented. So, uh, we begin by, yeah, before I forget, uh, the lectures are based on the material that uh, hopefully will be distributed to the participants in this summer school. <coughs> so, so the material, the PDF, the form of PDF will be put up on the website. So we begin by reviewing some basic ideas about quantum states. And so, suppose I have a, a source that generates uh, copies of quantum systems, can be electrons, can be photons. And suppose that we are interested in probing one type of degree of freedom, say spin of the electron, or polarization degree of freedom for photons. And in the two lectures, I'll focus on polarization degree of freedom. In general, in quantum mechanics, we can actually describe this source with an operator rho, and this is known as the statistical operator. So I'll just define stuff over in this column. So the statistical operator rho, or some of you may know this as density operator, this is an operator that is positive. And unit trace. So positivity just means that all expectation values of rho uh, is greater than or equal to zero. So knowing the identity of this statistical operator allows us to gain full knowledge, a complete knowledge about the source. And with this operator, we can compute. Uh, statistical quantities, we can make statistical predictions for any observable, for instance, observable A is defined to be the expectation value of A with respect to this statistical operator where A is just any observable. It can be positive uh, in the case of measurement observables, it can also be normal in general for arbitrary observables. Normal means that this observable A combines with its adjoint. So, which this is actually the ultimate goal in many experiments. So, finding out what the statistical operator is is just one of the ways of looking for expectation values of observables. So. <coughs> The goal of quantum state tomography is to find out what is the suitable choice of statistical operator that can be used to describe the source. And how do we do that? What we can do is that we can introduce a set of measurements. And this set of measurements has a few outputs, say M. So, this measurement setup is described by a set of positive operators, IJ.
IJ is positive and the operator sum to 1. The operators here I will call them measurement outcomes. In Mario's talk, the notations are E, EJ, EJ, and uh, the term for these operators, they are called events or, or measurement observed. So, what happens in an experiment is the following. For each outcome, there is a probability PJ that a particular observable occurs, or a particular outcome occurs. And this is related by the bond group, which is given by this statistical operator, which is unknown to us, and each of the outcomes. So this is an important equation. But in an experiment, so let me label this here, so we are actually measuring outcomes, ij, pi 1, pi m. Uh, this measurement outcomes in practice is actually a mathematical representative of a collection of components in a particular channel, a quantum channel. For example, if you have, if you are talking about Stern-Gala experiment, you will, so in this measurement setup, you will have uh, Stern-Gala magnets and uh, detectors. If you are talking about uh, quantum optics experiment, you will have wave plates, photo detectors, beam splitters, and so on. A collection of these components make up this positive operator. In an experiment, what you will measure is the number of occurrences in, for a particular outcome. For example, if you, if you count the number of times that this outcome occurs, We call it N1. And for the last outcome by N, we have Nm. So this, so Nj, or N, this N1, N2, all the way is the number of occurrences for each outcome. And the sum of this number of occurrences I define to be n n is actually the number of uh, copies or sampling events these are basically similar they mean the same thing so we can define another quantity another measurement quantity or nu, and nu is simply the number of occurrences nj divided by n. So in an experiment, we are really sampling the number of occurrences, and we can define the data in such a way that this individual data sums to the sums to one. So, there's a, a few points that I would like to make regarding the measurement data. If the number of copies n goes to infinity, then each of these measured data, or we call them frequencies, Each of them approaches a certain limiting value. And this limiting value we define it to be the true probabilities. And what can we do with this set of data? Well, with this set of data, we can now infer the identity of the statistical operator rho. And if n is infinite, then the data will approach the true probabilities and the, the 
the operator that we can obtain from this set of data, which I will call rho hat, approaches what is called the true state. So this is the true state. So in the literature, if you if you see the word true state, it just means that uh, the number of copies that you measure, the number of sampling events that you have, is infinite, and the data approaches the true state, uh, the true probabilities, and the statistical operator approaches the, the true state. So I would like to stress that the word true is actually borrowed from traditional statistics where you have an observation, you, you have some concept of true value, and in the experiment you estimate these true values and as n approaches infinity, the estimated value will tend to a true, probability, uh, true value. But this is just a topology. Because we can not interpret the statistical operator as some physical property of the of the system. It has to be take on the subjective nature. And there's there are some references in the uh, <coughs> in the introductory set of notes that uh, that talks about this this property of the statistical operator rather elegant. So in the first part of the talk. So this is basically what quantum state tomography is about. So in the first part of the talk, I will briefly talk about the measurements and what sort of measurements you can design to, to gain complete information about the source and then do state estimation or state tomography. In the second part, I will talk about how one can infer rho from the set of measurement data. <coughs> so how should we design the measurement outcome. We, for that, we need to understand the structure of the statistical operator. Well, the statistical operator being positive implies that it is also a measure. So if you have a d-dimensional human space, in other words, if your statistical operator that describes the source is d dimensional, there will be d squared real parameters to specify. And because the trace of the statistical operator is 1, the number of, the number of independent parameters to specify is d squared minus 1. However, just as there is a vector space for d-dimensional vectors that is spanned by d linearly independent uh, basis vectors, there is also a space for the space of statistical operators. And the dimensionality of this space is d squared. <coughs> so we really need d squared linearly independent operators to specify rho. And just to give you an example, suppose I have d equals 2. Then from Mario's lecture, we know that any statistical operator rho with two-dimensional statistical operator rho can be written as a sum of four operators, not three. So, Yes? Expression by d squared linear independent operator because d squared minus 1 will be independent. Yeah, I'll talk about this. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, yes. so, okay. So, that, so, so why 4? So, d, so, when d equals 2, we know that the statistical operator can be written as this, as such, where the, where the sigma column is actually a column of 3 Ali operators and each of them are represented by 2 by 2 matrix and S is a vector that is real and the length of the vector is 1 the, so from this expression you see that you need 4 
operators to specify this object. That is, the basis operators are 1 divided by square root of 2, sigma x divided by square root of 2, sigma y divided by square root of 2, and sigma z divided by square root of 2. We need four operators. These operators are linearly independent and they indeed specify as well. The, the, trait, the constraint for the trace comes in as a consequence of requiring only three, a three parameter real vector to specify rho. So these are two different concepts here. A statistical operator can be represented as an operator and this operator is in the space that is spanned by four basis operators. You can think of the statistical operator in a different way, namely that the statistical operator is represented by d squared minus one real vector and we call this the state space. So I will not go into too much of the detail. <coughs> But I will, I will focus on the linear independence of the operator space. Of this answer your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, with this idea of an operator space and the dimensionality of this operator space, we can now start to look, look at the properties <coughs> of. Uh, the properties of the. Measurement, of, measurement outcomes. By the way, uh, these measurement outcomes I forgot to mention, I will call it the POM. Mara calls it the positive operator value measure, I call it POM. And POM is simply the probability operator measurement. So with this, I can define now the concept of informationally complete measurements. What are these? If I have a set of outcomes, pi j, and if this set of outcomes consists of d squared linearly independent ones, outcomes, this means that the the set of operators is spend the entire operator space and we say that this set is informationally complete which means that if I, if I make use of this set of measurement and collect the data, the data that I have will be able the data that I collected will uniquely specify a statistical operator row for this source gives a unique answer. <coughs> so, with this, we can have two different kinds of information completeness. And by the way, in, in, in this lecture, I will just focus on information complete measurement. With this, there are two kinds of information complete measurements. If I have m equals d squared, this corresponds to a minimally complete measurement. Minimally, because I barely have enough uh, outcomes to, specify, to uniquely specify rho. If I have n greater than d squared, then this is called over complete measurement. So these are just uh, basic terms. So, I will give a machinery to help us determine whether a set of measurement outcomes is informationally complete or not. Because this is important. In an experiment, you you, you have a certain set of outcomes in mind and you want to see whether these outcomes are informationally complete. <coughs> and the way to do this is actually quite simple. We borrow the machinery from, vector, uh, from, from the theory of vector spaces. We construct a matrix G 
And this G has, uh, has matrix elements G, J, K equals the trace of pi J pi K. So this pi J and pi K, they are the outcomes. And this will of course be an M by M matrix because I have, say, M of them. And uh, there are a few properties of this one. So the first property is that this G matrix is positive. <coughs> I'll just list down the properties and then I'll say something about this. All these properties. So first of all, this G, which is also known as the Gram matrix, is positive. The second property is that suppose I label, suppose I denote the number of positive eigenvalues, non-zero eigenvalues, in other words, as n greater than j. So this is the number of non-zero eigenvalues. Then if this number is equal to d squared, which is the maximum number of I positive or non-zero eigenvalues for G you can have for this set of measurement, then this is informationally complete. We say that, and we know that the, the, the measurement outcomes or the data that came from this measurement outcomes is informationally complete. If not, then it's not informationally complete, we said it's informa in informationally incomplete. And for today we will concern ourselves with only this case. Uh, okay. There is a, a very nice formalism to actually argue this very naturally, but I don't have time to go through this formalism. It's basically turning the operators into cats in extended space and you can make use of everything you know about linear algebras or vector spaces to argue this, uh, these two properties. These are equivalent properties, by the way. <coughs> or or, or uh, this, these, are, these are the two basic properties uh, of G that can be argued from this form. Now right now I would like to give an example of such a measurement. So, the simple example, the only example that I'm going to give, unfortunately, for informationally complete measurement is actually for the sixth outcome, COM. Uh, this, you will see that this corresponds to the, the standard measurements that you, that you need to characterize Stokes factors of classical electromagnetic amplitudes. So, uh, in an experiment, what we do, we have a beam splitter, say, uh, 2 is to 1, and this means that the beam splitter transmits one, two parts of light and reflects one part of light, so we are going in the wrong direction. So, I have a beam splitter, 2 is 1. In the reflection arm, <coughs> I have a PBS, which is the polarizing beam splitter, if you know anything about this. This just means that it's a component that transmits horizontal and reflects vertical polarization. We are talking about polarization degrees of freedom uh, here, and, <coughs> and so this this component actually does that, that speeds horizontal reflex vertical polarization. <coughs> so, for polarization degrees of freedom, I hope that uh, everybody knows that it has two possible outcomes, only two possible outcomes, which can be, and any polarization can be written as a linear combination of these polarization cats. <coughs> so I have a detector here and I have a detector here. So the incoming signal comes in, and if I label the detectors one and two, in the end I will get pi. I will measure pi one equals 
h one third h from pi to equals b one third b because the vertical polarizations get reflected one third because I I reflect one part of light with this two detectors. Then in a transmission arm, I have another beam splitter. This time is one, one to one. The splitting ratio is one to one, so I, I reflect fifty percent of light and transmit fifty percent of light. In the transmitter arm, I can put a, a half wave plate, <coughs> right? And then again, I put a polarizing beam splitter. So if I call this three and call this four. Then the measurement outcomes I measure in this portion will be plus one third, plus, and uh, let me just write down the, the power operators for the previous two. So this is one plus sigma z divided by six, one minus sigma z divided by six, one plus sigma x divided by six. <coughs> One minus sigma x divided by six. So this is the measurement that you have. So the half wave plane actually turns this horizontal and vertical into plus and minus polarization. And you have this. In the in the reflection arm, I can put a quarter wave plane. And then I'll, I can put a polarizing beam splitter. And this time I label this as five and this as six. So the last two will be, as you can guess, <coughs> one plus sigma y divided by six. One minus sigma one divided by six. So this <coughs> this set of outcomes, uh, we call them six outcome form, and six. This six outcome form is also known as the mutually unbiased measurement for single qubits. So if you if you look at papers and and you see this mutually unbiased measurements uh, or qubits for single qubits, they actually refer to this set that consists of six outcomes. <coughs> so um, we so let's apply this machinery to this set of outcomes. What do we what do we get? Well we can we can express this G matrix, turns out that after some simplification, we do the trace inner product, we can we can see that the G matrix can be expressed as one divided by nine identity, six dimensional identity matrix, and the matrix by one divided by eighteen times all three minus I three. I three is the three dimensional identity matrix. Tensor product with O2. And what, what, what is O3 and O2? This ON is actually a matrix, n dimensional, with all entries equal to 1. Now, if you look, okay, so <coughs> this is just a way of writing things okay, so that you can compute the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues, the number of positive eigenvalues for this G matrix uh, turns out to be, if you compute it, it's one third, one over nine, one over nine, and one over nine. Four positive eigenvalues, which is the maximum number of positive eigenvalues that you can have for this set of outcomes. <coughs> and so, indeed, this is an informationally complete measure. We can do the same for any kinds of, all kinds of measurements. Finite dimensional, of course. Uh, <coughs> not sure whether you can generalize this to infinite dimensional, but for now we are talking about uh, Hubert space of dimension B by B is finite. So I will just. So the, the measurement <coughs> that I have just introduced is informationally complete, in fact, it's over complete. This anymore, and we will use this to look at how one can infer 
the identity row from the set of measurement data obtained. <coughs> and we will make use of this as an example. So, what? So how should we how should we interpret the data n1 to nm? Here, mu j is nj divided by n. Sum over j equals one to n is one. So how should we interpret the data to reconstruct the identity of row? This depends on the kind of questions that we ask with respect to the set of data that we have. And the second part of the talk will be to introduce three different ways of asking questions with respect to this set of data. So, the first question I can ask is what is what is The estimator row head, by the way, head here refers to estimate. <coughs> what, what is the row head, which I will label as sigma head, for this question, that satisfies the constraints for the set of data on J? In other words, we want to look for the estimator sigma head such that mu J is the trace of sigma head <coughs> times pi j. What is this sigma head? Uh, if, you, if you make use of, for example, the standard set of basis operators that span in the b equals 2 equal space, operator space, so it's sigma x divided by square root of 2, sigma y divided by square root of 2, sigma z divided by square root of 2 that we have mentioned previously. You can turn this set of equations into a matrix equation. <coughs> so, uh, suppose in this basis operators I can express rho uh, no, sigma hat in terms of a list of coefficients for them. <coughs> but this can be very general. So I have say T1 all the way to T D squared. <coughs> or so D dimensional operator, D squared dimensional operator space, I have D squared coefficients. These are real coefficients. And and uh, <coughs> in in the same set of basis operators that spend the D squared dimensional operator space. <coughs> I can define Q, which is a M phi B squared matrix. Then this set of equations can be turned into the matrix equation mu vector equals Q times T column. Where the nu columns, they are just a list of data frequencies that we have obtained in N. So, the job here is to invert this equation and to find out what this T column is. <coughs> and if a solution for this equation exists, we can do this and we define, say, T equals Q minus times new column. This Q minus is a D squared by M matrix. So, for, let's look at the case where D equals 2. Where D equals 2, in this set of basis operators, with this set of basis operators, and if I order the outcomes like this, so pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, all the way to pi 6 are ordered like that. Then Q can be written as a rectangular matrix which is 6 by 4, because D equals 2 means D squared equals 4, and the matrix will look like that. <coughs> so so 
one can look for this Q minus, we can always invert any rectangular array into, into another array. And for, for the case where there is always a solution, then T will be the correct solution. Uh, okay. So when n is infinite, the frequencies will be true probabilities as we have discussed. And by Born's rule, strains of ij equals pj, by Born's rule, we will always be able to look for a statistical operator that satisfies the true probabilities. This is fine. It is interesting to see what happens when n is not infinite, it's finite. So when n is finite, <coughs> when n is finite, Uh, there are a couple of things that can happen. First, say n equals one fifth. No, n equals five. Suppose I allow the outcomes to fire, and the total of, and the num total number of times that the detectors respond uh, is five. And suppose that the data that I obtain is one fifth, uh, one one one, say zero one one. Okay, so that means the number, of, so only the, the fourth detector doesn't click or doesn't fire. <coughs> I'll just write down the inverse for this array and you can probably convince yourself that this is in my list. You will see why. <coughs> so, yeah. So, yes. But the inverse is not unique with the right box. No. Uh, for any rectangular matrix, you can find a unique inverse Q minus. Yeah, but you can also find the others that would yeah, satisfy yeah. the second equation. Others that can? I mean, T equals Q minus. Yes, yes, yes. But, yes. but for. No, no. But for. If, by the day, if the solution exists for this linear system, T is unique. Because we are talking about informationary completeness, but I am talking about the Q minus. No, no, no. The, the Q minus is defined for this linear system. That's what I'm saying. This rule is fixed by the data. If you want T, <coughs> so if this system of equation has a solution, if you substitute this into this, right, then Q minus takes this form. That's, that's what I meant. <coughs> When you just substitute yes. T there, you will get Q, Q minus, Q, Q minus will be the other matrix. Yeah, I mean, you will get. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I, I you will get six, six times six. Right? Yeah, and I don't want to give uh, the properties of this Q minus because I just, want, I just want to tell you that if you take this. No, this. This way of writing the inverse is unique in the sense that it gives the solution, the correct solution T, if the solution exists. But yes. this is just this is just one of the, the, the people call it one inverse, which is one inverse, but I, just, I don't give the details on how one can compute this. This is just one of the many yes. pseudo inverses. Yes. 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 But it will always be the unique T. If T is information complete. <coughs> so when n equals 5, if you multiply this Q, this matrix to this data, you'll find that T, and you'll find that the resulting sigma n is, uh, is this matrix, is represented by this matrix, and this sigma n. First of all, this sigma hat is positive, which is what we want. But you find that this this data will have will result in no solution for this linear for, for this linear system. And so, if you if you try and substitute this t back into this equation, you will find that this equation is not satisfied. 
you substitute this to the right hand side of the equation, it's not satisfied. So this, this is what can happen when you have finite data. So linear inversion will not give you a correct answer because there's no correct answer in the first place. Right. <coughs> Suppose now you increase the you, you, you wait longer and the, you increase the number of copies. Say n equals 18. Then the data nu, say 18 is equal to 2, 4, 6, 0, 3, 3. For example, now instead of 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, you have 2, 4, 6, 0, 3, 3. Now you can give you. If you multiply this matrix to this column, then you find that if you substitute this T to this right hand side, you find that there is a solution, the solution exists because <coughs> this you, have, you can show that this is actually a solution to this uh, linear system. And the resulting estimator sigma hat is now one third, two third. Uh, over 9 over 9 come on, come on. 1 half 1 half so if you substitute this so if you look for this t and from this t you make use of these basis operators and express sigma hat in terms of these basis operators from this t which is obtained by multiplying this matrix and this data you get an estimator sigma head that looks like this. Now this is not positive. So two things can happen. If you have overcomplete data, if you have overcomplete measurement, which is the case that I'm showing you right now, if n is finite, two things can happen. You can have no solution to this linear system because there will be equations that are inconsistent with with each other. So you don't have a solution in the first place. So linear inversion will not give you any sensible result. Or there is a solution, but the solution will give you an estimator that is not positive. This is again a problem. Because we require a statistical operator to be positive in order to make statistical prediction. And in this case, it's not. So. <coughs> So linear inversion is not very satisfactory in certain cases in general. So we can we would like to have estimators that are positive. <coughs> and uh, of course you, you, need, you, you require more properties of the statistical operator, but this is the main problem here for linear inversion. So we can ask the second question. And to ask the second question. We will look at the probability that each detector gives a certain number of occurrences. And this probability is just the probability that the first detector responds raised to the power of n1 probability times the probability that the second uh, outcome responds raised to the power n2 and so on until you have pn and n. <coughs> so we ask the next question, what is the estimator which I label as rho hat rho hat ml, we'll see why in a moment, that maximizes this probability. And this probability is called the likelihood, where it's actually the the probability that the detectors give a certain sequence, a particular sequence of clicks or detection, <coughs> given that a statistical operator is rho. We want to look for an estimator that maximizes this function, where, where p1, p2, they are they're related by, again, by, the, by this one, by bonds. Right? So, <coughs> There is a way that, so there's a way to do this more generally. Uh, there are numerical schemes that do that. Given references, some reference, 
some references to, to this in the, in the introductory notes. <coughs> uh, but there's some properties that I'd like to discuss if I have time. So, so this rho hat and L, which is called the maximum likelihood estimator. One can look for this in the space of statistical operators, and so this estimator is always positive. <coughs> if, for the previous case, we were talking about linear inversion, we invert a set of, uh, set of equations. If the linear inversion technique gives us a positive estimator, this means that rho hat ml is the linear inversion estimator. Why? Because if the first question, I, so the first question is, what is the estimator that satisfies this constraint? The constraint from the data, mu j, and the, if you maximize this function, the maximum occurs, the true, the actual maximum occurs when P1 equals mu1, P2 equals mu2, and so on. Pj equals mu j. So if the estimator from linear version is positive, then that estimator is this estimator. It also maximizes the value. What happens if, if this linear estimator is not positive? Then you can, you can picture this in a graphical way. You can, if you draw a state space, it looks like a pancake, which is not a pancake, of course, but this is just for simplicity. And this is the likelihood function in the space of operators. And sigma hat not being a positive operator just corresponds to an operator sigma hat that is outside the state space. So the, the resulting rho hat ml must be at the boundary of the state space. So this means that if the linear estimator is not positive, this means that rho hat ml is rank deficient. Because an operator that lies on the boundary of the state space just means that you have zero eigenvalues and slight perturbation will result in, in an operator that, is, that lies outside the state space. <coughs> so, rho hat ml is rank deficient if this is the case. So I am at the end of my talk, and uh, I'm nearing the end of my talk, sorry. The last question that we can ask, so this is the second, the second way of reconstructing states. So the last question that we can ask is the following. For small n, For small n, this is the second question. The third question, and this is the last question for today, is that for small n, the likelihood function is quite broad. So you look like that. As n increases, the likelihood function gets. Uh, sharper and sharper, here the peak. But for small n, the linear function as a whole looks quite broad. So the uh, third question you can ask is that what is the estimated row head, which I now label as Bn? <coughs> what is the estimated that that accounts for neighboring states. Because the, the likelihood function is broad, this means that states around the maximum, they are almost equally likely. So it is a fair question to ask, how can we account for this neighboring states? So for example, if this is rho hat and L, and then there are a couple of neighboring states that have more or less the same likelihood. So how, how, do we, how do we account for these states? <coughs> so, 
if we know in addition to the, in addition to the data that we collected, if we know that the true state that is that can be used to describe the source takes a certain distribution, say it is more probable that the state the state row is a, for example a bell state and also a class of bell states or some other classes of states with a certain distribution, if you know that, then you can define an, a, another estimator which is rho and vm. And this accounts for the, the weight, the distribution of possible states that one can map. And this is captured by this object d rho, uh, d rho with parentheses. <coughs> this is usually called a prior. On top of that, you can also define so you can define the likelihood function as part of the weight because the likelihood function defines the shape near the maximum peak, near the peak. So the likelihood can also be used as a weight to weigh this to to, uh, for, to account for these neighboring states. And then you multiply by rho. So this is an average over all possible states in the allowed state space subjected to certain weights. But this is, of course, not normalized. You have to normalize it. <coughs> like this. So an estimator like this, this is just one way of accounting for neighboring states. Probably you can have other kinds of definition, but this is, this is generally known as the Bayesian mean estimate. So in the literature, if you, you look at tables that describe uh, Bayesian methods, it's just another method uh, to account for to account for uncertainties using conditional probabilities in your count and if you encounter this term Bayesian mean estimator more or less it refers to this kind of estimate <coughs> this kind of estimate and the property of this estimator is it is always full rank because you are summing over awfully many states in the state space so it's of course full rank <coughs> so you don't have estimators that are like that rank deficient So, uh, okay, so I think I will stop here because if I, if I continue, I will, I will exceed the time. But I'll just briefly mention that all we are talking about are measurements that are informationally complete. So we are looking at all possible ways of reconstructing states. If the measurement data of the, the poem is informationally complete, <coughs> I have shown you one example of such information and complete poems. There's, there's also another example. This is an over complete measurement. And there's also a, another example that is minimally complete, but I didn't show it here. And then I, I made use of this example to partially discuss the three different possibilities of reconstructing states. And uh, the first one is linear inversion, where you or you treat the data series and you say, you take this data and we look for the estimator that exactly, that exactly fulfills the, the requirements set by the data to bonds group <coughs> and then we obtain estimators and we, we, we discuss properties of these estimators and we found that there are problems with media inversion namely that media inversion sometimes will not give you a solution, this is number one but you can always define an inverse of this set of, of a set of linear equations. You can always do that. But, but the, the definition will not give you a, a sensible answer because there's no solution in the first place. Or there is a solution, there is a unique solution, but the solution is not a positive operator. And then the second question we discuss is, is, is to maximize the likelihood. 
and we find that we can always do that, and we can always enforce possibility on the estimator. The third for neighboring states that are more or less comparable, have more or less comparable likelihoods uh, with respect to. measurements and information in complete state tomography. It is not a it is not a comprehensive lecture of course because I left out the condition I left out the case where n is less than d square which means that the measurement outcomes are not informationally complete. There's some interesting things there but I, again I don't have time to discuss too much at all. So <coughs> Uh, and today we have discussed <coughs> uh, polarization degree of freedom of photonic sources. We have discussed actually photonic sources. Uh, in the lecture tomorrow, I'll discuss also photonic sources, but I will talk about a different degree of freedom, not polarization, but some other degree of freedom. And that will lead to <coughs> a statistical operator that, that is generally infinite dimensional. Again, this is discrete because I can, I can do it by counting the number of photons from a source. If a source produces not single photons, here we, I, again I forgot to mention that the source that we have been considering are single photon sources, which means that the source produces one photon at a time. If a source can produce more than one photon at a time, then there is another way of probing the source, and that is by photon counting. And photon counting is discrete. But we can also do this, we can also treat such photonic sources that produces more than one photon at a go at one time uh, by doing what is called continuous variable measurement. I will not talk about this at all today. I will talk about it. Uh, more. And I think I think continuous variable measurement is also something that Christian we will talk about after after lunch, I, I guess. <coughs> so with that I thank you once again for tolerating the not so comfortable me and listen to my not so fantastic lecture. And I thank you for your attention.